Hi, I'm Christina O'Malley, and this is Better Science Teaching. All right, so we're getting really close to the start of the school year for most of us, and some people are going to be online, and some people are going to be in person. And I know that in my class, I like to do as many things hands-on with my students as possible. Normally, at the beginning of the year, that's doing some simple measurement labs and kind of practicing how we learn in my class. Um, but this year feels a little bit different. I think a lot of you are feeling that, too. That this year, we have... Um, we have a pandemic going on. We have students that may or may not be coming to us um, being required to wear masks. It's one of the things that I feel a little bit of responsibility for, helping my students to understand why we need to wear masks, why it's important and how it can help us um, in, in this situation. So that causes some problems for us, right? So if we're gonna see our students virtually, we're working with, you know, do kids have things at home that they can use for science? And if they're with us in person, um, you know, we're trying to reduce how close our students are to each other. So that limits group work. And also if students are able to share supplies. And so that might mean we need to, if we want to do a lab, we have to do something that students can do independently. Um, and that has supplies that we can have one for everybody, which sometimes is challenging. You know, some of our equipment, we only have six or eight of because we assume this group work thing in science class, we have lab groups. But this is a little bit different. What I wanted to do with this video is show you a couple ideas of things that you could use as starting points to talk to your students about. Um, yeah, okay. So um, hand washing is one that's really important. My recommendation for hand washing, if you're gonna teach hand washing, I know that that pepper soap thing went crazy in the spring and I find that one really frustrating because a lot of the explanations for it involve things like, look, the pepper is repelled by the soap. Please be careful with that. If you're a science teacher, please don't teach children that somehow having soap and using soap repels germs. It's not really what's happening. But there's lots of great videos about using soap. And if you want to make hand washing kind of fun and teach them about effective hand washing, there's some great videos about the way that um, the way that surgeons wash their hands, you know, where they, where they wash all the surfaces and every finger. And what you could do that might actually be fun, especially if you're an art teacher, is get some paint and put paint on their hands, you know, and then have them do a relay or something. But you have to be careful with that too, because you don't really want kids racing because you want them to spend the appropriate amount of time on it. But it is a really good visual way to show kids hand washing. But I don't, I don't want to belabor hand washing in this video. So we have these lab challenges where we need to have things that are individual, that are either disposable or that we have one of each and is easily cleaned. Um, and kids can't share stuff and that's kind of challenging. And so I was trying to think through, well, what are the questions or the misconceptions that students might have about mask wearing that we could address quickly and easily in a hands-on way that's not gonna leave too much of a mess for you? Because in, in my building, I'm gonna be cleaning after every period. So there's, there's already gonna be some cleaning happening. Um, so the first one is the idea that somehow masks make it hard to breathe. So there, there's some videos that have, that I have seen about this where you do tests on your mask to see how effective they are. So I have a mask here it's from a bulk purchase from Sam's Club, you know, which is like Costco, if you have Costco. I've seen these at Walmart, which is basically the same as Sam's, same company. Um, I got 50, this was like $17, I think. So if you have 100 students, that scales up to like 35 bucks. It's kind of a lot, you know, like maybe your school would let you have one per student to do some testing with. Um, I don't think that this is irreversible testing. So I think they'd still be usable. But this is basically my car masks. Um, I just throw them in there in case I forget them when I'm shopping. Anyway, so I've got a mask and we do know that if I sit here and blow, I can blow in a very directed, hard way. So one thing that I got, is a set of bubble wands. There's 90, look at how pretty these are. There's 90 bubble wands in here, all different colors. I'm still on the fence if I'm gonna let kids take them home. I have a feeling that could end up with trails of soap all over the building, but it's just a tiny little wand. And if I pull this out and I'm not wearing a mask, you know, and I, this part I couldn't do in my classroom unless I was standing enough distance away from everyone. So that's kind of tricky. You'd have to make a decision about that. But the thing that's nice about bubble wands is everybody knows what bubble wands are and everyone knows that they work. You know, that you can blow bubbles. Um, 
you know, if you get a really inexpensive set of bubbles, you know, sometimes you have issues like the bubble solution breaks as soon as you blow the bubbles. Um, these don't seem to be that way. Bubbles. Let's see if I can pull them so they go slower. Okay, so I got some bubbles. Um, and what that indicates to me is that I am capable of successfully exhaling, right? That's it. If I take my mask and put it on, right, I'm gonna pinch my nose down because that's correct. You know, we wanna make sure that our airflow is limited because we wanna force it through the mask. And I find that if I take my bubble wand, I played with this earlier today too. I cannot get bubbles to come out of my bubble wand, which is like, why is, what's the point of the bubble wand? The misconception you don't want kids to go home with is it's impossible to breathe through my mask. But as a teacher, you can anticipate that, right? Kids are gonna try different things too. They might try to blow bubbles through the sides. I, to be honest, I would let them do it. But that first kid that says to me, Dr. O'Malley, I can't breathe through my mask. I'm gonna suffocate. Here's what you got. This is a $23 pulse oximeter from Amazon. This is pretty cool. So that first kid that complains, I'm gonna be like, okay, watch this. This device will measure the oxygenation of your blood. Now this only goes up to 90, it, it will never say you have 100% oxygenation. I've had it on for a while today and I've gotten it to 97. That's the lowest it was. And it was as soon as I put it on. Come on. It's, it's reading. Okay, so that kid is gonna get this thing and I'm gonna ask them to look at there. See, there's 97 again as soon as I put it on. So that kid is gonna get to wear a pulse oximeter and we're gonna see if his oxygenation actually drops. Um. And I bet other kids are gonna to wanna to try this. And this one is pretty straightforward to clean. So it's just, it's just two really solid pieces and there's a, there's a laser, there's a red light in there. But you know, this is just cleaning it with a wipe. So now we've got kids know that what's happening is they can't blow bubbles. That's the observation. The explanation for that is because that whatever I'm exhaling is being diffused through the mask, right? Diffusion is where we're just spreading out, spreading out the particles. Obviously I can still breathe. If I couldn't breathe, I would have passed out. Or my pulse oximeter would have told me so. So those are, those are some things that we can kind of deal with in class. So I thought that this would be handy to have around um, for myself, for anxious students, if, un you know, if in the unfortunate situation, someone in my family has COVID, then I have this handy, you know, just like having a thermometer this year to use your pulse oximeter. So there we go. So I would recommend having that. Um, another version of the same kind of thing is one that Bill Nye put out where he was blowing out candle flames. Candle flames are great. They're also very on fire. And I decided... For my classroom, I would prefer to deal with bubble solution that got spilled than accidents from fire or dealing with either running around the classroom to light a bunch of candles or giving kids matches. Uh, as I don't, I just don't have matches in my room. I have like a little starter. Okay, so that's the first thing to consider. The second one is that there's no point in wearing a mask because it doesn't trap particles. Okay. So there's a lot of things to unpack about that. So if we wanted to do an experiment about whether or not masks can trap particles, well, our first problem is that we need some kind of aerosol particle. So um, I have always wanted an excuse to buy these. I bought a bunch of these saline nose spray bottles. They're really great for um, getting, getting really fine mists. And so I've always wanted them so I could do flame tests with them. But for some reason, like buying them for flame tests was was not enough justification, but now I have tons of them. And this is again, something, you know, I can just leave it. I can give it to students like this with no lid so they don't have to handle the lid. And this is a bottle, I can clean this. Um, things to know about these, they do create a mist of droplets. I don't know if you can even see it on the camera. Yeah, don't go for the big ones. 
So there's little tiny droplets that are coming out of here and I was kind of afraid that it'd be hard to see. But there's a very fine mist that comes out of these and they're designed that way because this is something that you use to clean out your sinuses. And so I use these when my sinuses get really bad or if I get sick in the winter. But you spray this and inhale at the same time and it pulls it back into that sinus cavity. So these are cool. The droplets are about one micrometer to 100 micrometers, which is pretty tiny. This I think is the most efficient way to get tiny droplets. Uh, so the way that you can do this experiment is <clears throat> I would give kids color, like maybe a full sheet of colored paper and let them spray this and tell them to pick an angle, but try to be consistent because <clears throat> then they can spray. So the big ones that you can actually, see, I'm like watching myself as I record this, the big ones you can actually see are kind of big chunks, but there's actually finer ones that come out. There we go. That's better. Um, but if you have some colored paper laying somewhere, so I've got like a little colored post-it note and I know about where this is falling. Um, you can actually visually see the droplets on there. You guys see them, the little marks where they landed. And so you can have students be able to indicate that they're there. The other way that you know that they're there is you can feel them. This is not, you know, so if I'm holding it away from me and I've got my hand here, I can, I can feel, I, well, I can see that they're coming right here but I can see where they are and feel them. Now, if you take a mask and you can cover, you know, pretend like this is a sneeze. You're making a mechanical sneeze. And if you spray this at your mask, you notice it doesn't fall on the other side. So like for me sitting here, just playing with these things, I can tell that it's not landing on my leg. I have a pair of shorts on. So I can tell that it's not getting all the way through here. It's getting stopped by the mask. And that's important because the reason that we're wearing masks is because if we all do it together, even those of us who might be carrying the virus who don't have symptoms will prevent it from spreading to other people. All right, that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward. And this is just a experiment that says, does this trap particles? It, it, we know that it traps droplets that are smaller than a hundred micrometers. So that's good to know. Um, some kids may come at you with like, well, virus particles are smaller. Well, that's, they're, they don't just like leap out of your nose. You know, they're always attached to aerosols that are coming out even when we're just talking. So masks, masks can trap particles. You can breathe with them on. They do help. Lastly, why are we social distancing? Some people say six feet and some people say three feet and some people say 10 feet and what? Okay, easy. This is a good one. So this doesn't go three to 10 feet, that's a problem. So what I needed was something that was really lightweight that would stay aloft to indicate to kids, hey, sometimes things travel farther than we would expect them to. So here's a good model to start with. A bubble gun, how fun is this? Okay, so in addition to our little bubbles, I've got a bubble gun, I bought a second one. These both came from Target. This one was $5. This one was $3 and you don't need one for every student. You just need one for you. Um, I haven't opened this one yet, but the reviews that I've heard about this is that if it tilts sideways, sometimes, I mean, it's a $5 bubble wand. Sometimes the bubble solution goes up into this and then back down into the battery chamber and then it will die, but it should work for the day. It should work for one day. If nothing else. Um, I want to pop this out because I want to see how powerful it is but it didn't, I, it wasn't gonna show any better on camera, so I just didn't open it. Okay, so a bubble gun. This thing has a little foam, but you're not gonna hurt yourself with this. It came with a tray uh, that I can put bubbles in that it also came with. So the idea here is that if I have aerosol particles in the atmosphere, well, what are the variables that matter? Uh, one of them is how, how long those viral particles are being produced in the space that I'm in. You know, so does it matter if I'm standing by someone who may have a virus and I'm standing there for one minute versus 10 minutes? Does that increase the likelihood that I'm gonna get a lot of virus particles from them? And then the second one is how far away really matters. Now, this is a model. I honestly, I tell my students that we kind of lie to them when we make up these models sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, and that there's gonna be a place where every model fails. If you're doing something that represents something else, it's gonna fail. So here where the model fails is I'm gonna blow bubbles. These aren't actual virus particles. They're not actual aerosols. 
Um, these are probably larger than aerosols that are going to travel a large distance. I, I know that because I felt how far they traveled. By the way, interesting anecdote. I talked to a nurse friend of mine. She's a PhD. She's wonderful. And she said that one of the ways that they test mask fit is they have like a sugar water um, spray and they see if they can taste it. <laughs> so if you felt really adventurous, you could spray this around your students and see if they could taste the saline. I'm not going to feed my students anything. All right, so back to the bubbles. So here's our bubbles. Um, if I... I dip my bubble gun in my bubble wand and I can sit here. And what I liked about this is I could just keep blowing bubbles, you know, so the kids could say, well, they'll travel this distance. If you're looking at how far they travel, give every kid a sheet of colored paper because when the bubbles land on it, it'll leave a mark. So I'll get a new post-it note so you guys know it's not my nasal spray post-it note. Um, if I take this and I spray bubbles at it, it leaves droplets. You can see those. So you could have kids across the room with different sheets of paper and just blow bubbles and say, all right, we're gonna stop um, and count who has bubbles after one minute or after one squirt or whatever. You know, okay, we're gonna do it again. Okay, keep watching who has bubbles and just let these fly around the room. And kids are gonna get, if you connect this to how long things stay in the air, they're gonna to start to understand why the timing part is important, that these particles can stay airborne for some time. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's a bunch of creative things you can do. Variables you could look at are things like how long the bubble spray was on. You could mask the bubble spray, right? You could load this thing up and you could put a mask on it. You guys saw this, right? Without mask, with mask. Um, so there's something you could do. You could look at the distance that the bubbles can travel. You can change the parameters of your room. You could change, um, you know, do you have a fan on in your room? You could, uh, it'd be hard to do a humidifier, but you could do that too. Um, but there's different ways that you could test some of these ideas about mask wearing and safe distances in ways that have real meaning and real value and help students build a correct mental model. So one reason that I wanted to put this out earlier is because I was hoping to get some feedback from you guys. Um, are these are these good ideas? But I'm also kind of wondering where the plot holes are because I've been thinking about them. I've talked to some of my colleagues and some of my friends who are science and nurse people about them. Um, but I'm really interested to hear what ideas that you guys have that might help these be a little bit better. So if you have ideas you could share with the community, make sure you comment below. Um, consider subscribing. We'll have Science Fair Friday out again on Friday. Stay safe, be well, and I'll see you soon. Bye.